Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nella Brown, and uh, I'm going to be uh, showing a few slides and uh, hopefully playing in a bit of sound. We've just tested it early on, so it works pretty well. So what I wanted to talk about is about these kind of concepts of collaborative music making and the reason why I say it's in 21st century is because obviously technology in the last decade has changed in so many ways the way we do music. Um, before I start, I just wanted to give you a little bit of kind of a brief intro about me. I am uh, from Croatia and when I was sort of growing up, uh, I was uh, going into music school, I was learning how to play piano and then afterwards I sort of uh, started playing uh, saxophone, studied engineering and sort of played with bands and did all sorts of usual kind of musical activities that someone does when they're very young. Um, I then moved to England, I was just kind of traveling and this sort of uh, met some other bands there and I decided to sort of stick around a little bit and play and also uh, at some way in the process of playing with various funks and jazz ensembles I kind of uh, stumbled upon this kind of idea of sequencing and having a computer to do some of the composing for you. So that was kind of a big revelation because uh, up till that point I think my last band it was a nine piece band and it was quite difficult to organize all the rehearsals and get them from one space to another and it was always kind of these phone calls are you free are you not free etc but now all of a sudden I had this computer and I can just do everything by myself which was a lot of fun and uh, I sort of decided because I've done classical training and jazz training and sort of playing in general with bands I thought what would be a fun thing to do is kind of do a full circle so I went and started Sonic Arts and I did that at Middlesex University. That was the best course ever. And I don't know, for some strange reason, they ran out of funding and now they folded it. Otherwise, I would re recommend to everybody to go and study that. And that sort of led to all sorts of new things for me because uh, after I finished my degree, I tried to get a job just until my kind of sound design career kicked off. And I went to a few interviews and everybody was telling me, oh, Sonny Cards, what's that? Oh, that's so much fun, da, 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 da. And then after this uh, fantastic interview, later on, I will get the news saying, oh, you're just too creative, your talents will be wasted. I can see so many of the audience laughing about it, you know, what I'm talking about. And so I thought, well, I'll do, I'll just uh, employ myself. So I registered myself with Inland Revenue as a freelance sound recordist stroke. Um, sound mixer, because that's, they don't have sound artists on there. And uh, I basically launched into the sound design and I found uh, there's kind of a whole heaps of plays and theatres and, uh, and documentaries and filmmakers that wanted to employ me to do some stuff. And basically that's what I did. So in a short space of time I've racked up a huge numbers of plays and I designed sound for theatre, dance, film, documentaries, interactive sound installations, sonic branding for web designs, uh, recently mobile phone um, application, and of course I was doing some circuit bending and hacking into musical toys because that's where the big fun is. I'm sure some of the guys out in the tent are doing some of this stuff right now. Um, uh, after sort of a, that, my, my, my kind of a road from that sort of music to kind of engineering to kind of a bands, to Sonic Arts then led me to the PhD in computer science, which is what I'm doing now at Queen Mary University of London. And of course, soon as I've passed my stage one uh, report, which is within one year, I was sitting in my office, I'm thinking, oh, what's the next thing I can do? I should start up a girls hacking club. Oh, where are the girls? Okay, no girls in the office and come out of the hallway, no girls there. And so I had to do a little bit of research around the department to find some girls. But as you can see, I found quite a few of them. And we sort of started this project called G-Hack. We got some funding from Queen Mary's and we've, I've been a chair of the project for the last three years. And in that time, we have done, again, an enormous amount of stuff. We have exhibited, we got commissioned to do interactive sound installations. We exhibited in VNA uh, at a CMMR conference. As a matter of fact, we just got one of our pieces into a CMMR conference in Marseille. So we'll be taking uh, one of the projects that I'm going to show later on to Marseille in a, a month time. And also, the, the other thing that we did, this project is kind of about, they're all female PhD students, mainly computer science and uh, electronic engineering, and we sort of are, have different skills in the club. And so we teach each other skills like programming and circuit bending and wiring and, and, and just put collaboratively kind of thing, our skills together when we come up with the project that we want to do. So we're not bound by any kind of a restrictions university. Sometimes you get commissioned to do something, but the brief are still open. So we can exercise our skills as much as we possibly want. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. But today I wanted to talk to you about this sort of a collaborative music making concept. And I'm going to take you back to some of my old years uh, as what I call the old school type of making. I don't know whether there's any musicians here 
in the audience at all. Anybody plays any instruments? Everybody's nodding their head. Oh, some instruments over there. Oh, two. Well done, well done, sir. So as you know, this is my last band, uh, sort of when you have this band situation, you've got like loads of instruments, so you've got somebody playing the bass, guitar, saxophone, various type of saxes, and you have this kind of ways of amplifying your instruments so you can hear yourself, that's like your monitoring. Then you also have this kind of monitor which is in front of you, so if you're kind of playing a guitar or if you're kind of a single vocals, you can, see, you can hear yourself and see what you're doing. And this is very important in this kind of a collaborative music making scenario. Because if everybody's playing at full speed and sort of a full volume and you don't have any means of monitoring what other people are doing, soon enough you'll kind of, a, yes, it's a mess, thank you very much, sir. It becomes a huge mess. So this thing here, it's kind of a very important. And why I'm highlighting this is because obviously we'll get to why that is so important. So some of the challenges when you have when you're playing in a band in this kind of scenario are, of course, you have to play in the key, you know, on beat. Hopefully you have a drummer that can keep the beat and that, that makes everything really simple. And you have to hear what everybody else is doing, where it's where the monitoring is coming in, because you're not just playing on your Marshall amplifier, uh, put on the number 11 and not really caring about what everybody else is doing because you'll get kicked out of the band very soon or booed off the stage or something. And in a way, everybody sort of plays mono, so it's like one instrument, one sound, everything gets mixed into a mixing desk and then it gets piped out. So the two monitors, stereo monitoring speakers, out, out there to the audience. So whatever's happening behind the stage, everything gets mixed up and you really just hear that in a proper PA system. So you've got this kind of restrictions of, okay, you have to move around and dan dance and sing and such, a, such things. So there can be kind of a, some sort of restrictions and uh, sometimes feedback can occur. Um, you can sometimes have an argument with your band members, which is sort of the interaction in between the players. Um, as well, of, of course, the whole point is that you entertain the audience so you play good music. And to play good music, you have to practice. And so the thing, the practice makes perfect, but also this kind of a whole debate is like a musicianship versus, you know, professional musicians versus amateur musician. What does it mean? Do you need to go to school? Do you need to learn how to play the guitar properly, learn how to sight read notes, etc., etc.? And some guitar players that I've played with have not been to music school. But then again, if they have some knowledge of the chords, etc., then you can really quickly work out in rehearsals what you're playing, what is a song about. If you shout out, you know, CFD, they just all go and everything is really, really simple. So this is the old school. And now I just wanted to sort of look up some of the, some of the extensions of this old school, which are kind of a building on this tradition, but kind of a using some mostly digital or partly digital ways of doing things. And for instance, we got this project, a software called eGem Audio, eJaming Audio. So if you, for instance, are now don't have a band, uh, don't have time to organize anything, you can just download the software, you can log in, you can basically say, okay, I want to jam with another guitarist, with another drummer, etc. You can find people remotely anywhere and you can just all jam together. When you get fed up with it, it doesn't cost you anything, you just turn off the internet, say in chat window, everybody goodbye. And you can have as much as fun as you want. And it's not expensive because you don't have to hire any equipment or you, have, you don't have to even sit in your car, drive off with your uh, amplifier anywhere and you don't have to pay for rehearsal space. And you can just, if you don't like the players this week, you just, next week you say, you know, Jack, you're playing Cirques, I'm going to go with Dan next week and you just jam with another person. It's sort of a, nobody takes it personally, it's just a jam. Some of the other projects that I found also interesting is now we have this kind of a cloud everything. And now we have, for instance, projects like Ohm Studio, which is a cloud-based workstation. So you can work with musicians, you can compose a bit of music, then sort of they upload it from the cloud, they work on it. You can also edit and copy and master and everything all at the same time. Uh, everything is as well saved, so you don't have to worry about losing the music. And it's just kind of, a, an, a, a, again, it's sort of a, another way of collaborating with people without having to go to the studio. So now you just sit at home, have a cup of tea, and then you make a piece of music, ship it to somebody for some drums, ship it to somebody else for some saxophone lines, and then basically, you know, remix it, mix it, and uh, it's all really, uh, really easy. And it, of course, works cross-platform, which is very important as well. And of course, uh, an another extension, or shall I say, sort of thing, a modification or gamification of the old school playing is the, the Guitar Hero. So in the beginning, the Guitar Hero just had the possibilities of you can use this sort of a controller where you can just play the guitar and there's all sorts of known tunes and you only have four buttons and it's really, it was really, really easy to play and the more uh, notes you hit, the better your score. 
And then, of course, they came up with this brilliant idea, which is like the whole band, and they called it Guitar Hero World Tour. So you can have four players, which is even more fun. So in this case, you have to have some people over, so get your friends over, and everybody picks up what they want to play, and there's even a vocal. And then you just load up the game, and everybody plays. This guy's trying to play the guitar, this guy's playing, this guy's uh, 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 singing. And you can have as much as fun as you want. And sort of uh, the whole, I guess, point of this sort of a game is that you don't really have to be a musician. If you can follow up where the notes are and you have the kind of things to press here, you can just really click quickly actually learn the tunes and you can become a real proficient player of this game, like any other game, apart from it's sort of a game of a rock band. Mm, another interesting example is, for instance, talking about the classical music playing and the classical orchestras. So, for instance, in this project, this latency canons, uh, composer Ray Lustig, who's working at Juilliard, he sort of come up with this idea. He wanted to compose something which plays on the whole teleconferencing delay that you get when you kind of uh, play remotely with people. And he sort of uh, composed this piece. So you've got an orchestra in one place, then you have some other orchestra people uh, somewhere remotely, and you can see them there on the, on the screen. And the whole idea is that the piece plays on the fact that there is a delay. So when the conductor in this room, you can see him in the middle, raises his hands, there's a delay between uh, uh, when the people who are in remote locations see them and start playing something. And that creates kind of a latency and actually creates a composition. And so what was, what was interesting in the video that uh, when he was explaining this project, he said, oh my God, you know, I've, I've composed this piece. And then one year later, all of a sudden, this, the delay wasn't as big. It was like a ruin in the composition. So it was like, oh, I need to recompose this and add some polyphony. So, you know, you sort of, uh, the, the technology has moved forward from the time he's kind of, uh, you know, made it in his head that it's going to be a big delay. So that was kind of funny. I thought you need to sort of rearrange things. Um, after, so that's some of the examples of sort of a like, you know, extending and kind of using partly technology and things like that. But now I want to talk about new, calling new, like now almost a decade old, kind of ideas of sort of orchestras. So the first example is the Princeton Laptop Orchestra. I don't know whether any, any of you have heard about laptop orchestras at all. Nobody's shaking their hands. So see, the whole idea is that, of course, now we have these instruments which are laptops. And the guys at Princeton, they, in 2005, they kind of came up with this idea, why can't we use these laptops as instruments? But then we had this issue about how do we hear ourselves and how does the audience hear ourselves? So if you connected all these laptops through a network and then everything came out to the speaker, stereo speakers, all you would see is like a whole bunch of people standing there and doing that. You probably wouldn't even see that because it, it'll be just a whole bunch of people behind laptop. You don't know who's doing what. They can't hear what their musical contribution is. And again, it's like, we don't know what it's going to sound like. Sort of thing. It's a kind of a bit of a messy situation, not like a band. You're not listening to anybody. You're not hearing anything. So they basically came up with this idea of that they had to design these speakers, which kind of a radiate sound in different directions in space to get them closer to like musical instruments. So they're now using uh, six channel speakers, you can see them on the floor, which are speakers and as well as monitors. And because they're standing so close to each laptop, you perceive them as this is the voice of this instrument. So laptop immediately becomes an instrument and you can give it any timbre because of course, through a laptop, you can process anything you want. And so they sort of are sitting next to their uh, uh, laptops and they've got audio interfaces and they're all connected by internet. So for syncing sort of uh, possibilities as well as for easier uh, conducting, especially when you compose a piece. But this is kind of a, the big, big thing when you do things like with orchestras and live musicians and you're kind of using devices that don't necessarily have a big sound output. Uh, we have uh, a year later, uh, Moscow um, Center for Electroacoustic Music decided to start up their own laptop orchestra and they call them Cyborg Orchestra. And while sort of a Princeton uh, still has a repertoire, which is sort of their things that are composed for the orchestra as well as there can be some improvisations, this was made by the musicians and sort of programmers and they really kind of wanted to focus on like this improvisation or kind of anything can happen. So, you know, you contributing some sound, I'm contributing some sound, sort of a, like a free line kind of a jamming and explore the sort of interaction in between the players and kind of how they negotiate what's being played. And a uh, little after that, of course, we have the ubiquitous uh, phones and mobile phones. 
and Ge Wang, who was actually at Princeton when the Laptop Orchestra started over there, uh, came to Stanford, and then he first he started Stanford Laptop Orchestra, and then not long after, then 2007, he started this uh, mobile phone orchestra, or the MoFo. And in the beginning, they were just using the, I think they were using Nokia phones, I've forgotten what model, and they were just using the output, regular output of the mobile phones. They've composed some things, they can be played, and there was also some interaction and sort of improvisation in there. And then obviously they've realized this thing about, okay, sound in space, mobile phone, small speaker, how do we sort of negotiate that? And then they went on to design these sort of speakers that you can hand, uh, have on your, uh, on your hand. So again, there's this monitoring, how do we hear each other's contribution, how do we know what kind of music, what am I making, what are you making, and how does it all fit together, which becomes uh, important. Uh, moving on to the modified toy orchestra, uh, I don't know whether anybody knows about circuit bending and sort of hacking into toys and making them into musical instruments, adding some knobs and all that sort of stuff, it's all good fun, you should try it. I'll show uh, a book later on that you can sort of uh, use as an example of uh, doing things. So Modified Door Orchestra, they'd, they decided that some of the uh, sonic elements that they're going to use in their composition are going to be these uh, circuit bent toys. And so, as you can see, various kind of examples of the toys that have been hacked in me uh, and, and extra knobs have found their way in there so you can kind of modify the sound that they've been in there. Because the musical toys that the kids get, there's only maybe a few tunes they play. And so it's not like you can do sound synthesis with it, but if you add a few knobs, you can. So, and then of course they have, you can see they've got the monitors, so everything is going to the mixing desk and to the laptops and they're mixing all the sound in that way. Uh, one of my favorite, ZX Spectrum Orchestra. I don't know whether anybody remembers these uh, ZX Spectrum computers. Oh, are you showing your age now, sir? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so this, this project is there basically kind of a decided to really um, concentrate on just kind of using the sounds that are made from the ZX Spectrum uh, and as well as sort of using the speech engines or anything like that in their composition. And I mean, I'll, I'll try to now play. Oops, maybe not. Will I be able to play this? No. Okay, never mind. I might go back to play some examples later on. Um, so, so the challenges, as I was saying, about this sort of a, these kind of a new type of orchestras are pretty much kind of a lined up to the, the old bands that we had. It's like, you know, some people play mono, now they might play stereo because you've got the laptops, etc. Sound mix is spatial. Where is the sound and how is it sort of mixing? How much control do we have? Do we have to make some new speakers, new ways of monitoring to, uh, uh, to facilitate that? Uh, how do we hear individual contributions? Sort of a, there can be a complex interaction in between the device and the user. Sometimes in laptop orchestra, it could be just a few people program something that you know play and everybody else knows how the patch works. So the contribution is that they're following some sort of score. So it's not improvisation, it's just kind of like a regular orchestra. Or sometimes you can uh, make some of your own programming and then you just kind of uh, contribute to it so it's more like free improvisation. And of course, if you have laptops and software, it's kind of a more known device, but then, you know, uh, toy orchestra, it's like, it can be anything. If you give that toy to somebody else, they'll really have to kind of learn how to tweak the knobs and how to use it. And that goes for every new instrument that's out there. Uh, that hasn't been on the market before, you haven't played before. And then, of course, we're coming on to the kind of a cost of devices, whether they're available. And we now have this kind of applications for iPhones and mobile phones and iPads that are quite cheap compared to owning a guitar and a Marshall amplifier, really. No comparison. And uh, so it's sort of a opening things up. The digital is opening things up to kind of everybody who's a musician and who isn't a musician. Um, live coding is another sort of ways of, it's kind of like you can have a laptop orchestra with live coders. I don't know whether anybody knows what live coding entails. It's sort of a, uh, you would start off with a blank slate. I'll show a picture of it, right. So you start, start off with a blank slate and then you would basically, there'll be nothing on the screen and you would punch in a few lines of code and all of a sudden you hear sound. And a, as the performance progresses, you will hear more and more and you will see in real time modification to the code which will then modify the sound. So that's kind of the whole idea is of course, you know, live coding without looking at the screen, it's not quite the same because you then start to follow and see, oh, what is he doing? Is he adding an oscillator? Is he, oh, the volume's going down? What is he, is he using chords? How does this work? So this kind of all like, uh, 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 you kind of interact and you know, are visually engaged with what's going on the screen as well as hearing you know what they're actually doing and top lap is an organization that started in 2004 and they to explore and promote live coding as well as in sound uh, as well as the visual as well 
So, moving on to the mobile and, uh, well, we have now a plethora of sort of a mobile applications, as everybody knows, on various iPhone, iPads, etc. And I will try to play now something which I hope will play. So this is an example of um, mobile phone application for collaborative music making that I've designed a sound for. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of designing sound for that. But it's sort of a, I'll, I'll play it and then we'll talk in a second when it's finished. Is it playing? Do we have sound? So we did this uh, application for last year's Music Tech Festival and the whole kind of idea was to have kind of people as instruments. It was all about, we don't want people to be looking at the screen, we don't want them to be do, trying to do something here and do any kind of composition. So it's very simple, we had kind of nine colors and you scan the color, when you scan the color it's assigned a, a to a sound and then there's sort of a different ways in which you can manipulate the sound. But the idea is that you don't worry about any of the stuff here. You just kind of then shake it, wave it, and then it's collaborative music making because you're playing it with anybody who's there at the Music Tech Festival. So loads of people wearing different kind of colored t-shirts and they would just scan it around. And so one of the sort of challenges of that was that you design a sound and kind of everything needs to go with everything kind of in sync in time or whatever fit with everything. But then you have no idea what the users are going to do. They just, you know, they can just be shaking it all the time and that kind of has to be working well with whatever the other user is doing who can just be doing that or doing pitch shifting like this or whatever. So it's kind of a, for me as a sound designer who's like used to working in, in a theater when everything is locked, you know, exactly what you're getting, you know, whatever you played out there, unless the engineer doesn't put the fader up, it's all going to come out exactly how you've done it. But in, in, and in the games as well, if you do sound design for games, it's like you design something, that's exactly how it's going to play and you test it and it's like no different going away about it. But with this kind of thing, you sort of have to test it with the user and you have to kind of see and predict how they're going to play. I mean, sometimes you can predict things, but then you just kind of get a few friends around and it's like, okay, let's just test this to see whether this works well. And it's fun because every time it plays differently. So you get kind of a different combinations and different improvisation and composition all the time depending on who's using the, uh, the interface, which is uh, quite fun. And I wanted to show another example now. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to click on this. I am a big fan of Gewang, who's uh, started MoFo and uh, uh, Stanford, La uh, Stanford uh, Laptop Orchestra as well. And he's now, uh, um, he's now in, in a company called Smule, which produce all sorts of fun uh, musical interfaces for iPads and iPhones. So now, if I press this, I'm guessing it's going to take me to another slide. Okay. Let's see. Ooh. Oh, we don't have internet here, do we? Sorry? There's no internet. Oh, in that case, I don't think we're going to be able to do that, are we? Oh, there is internet. Is there internet? Oh, but I don't have the thingamajig. You know, no worries. I'm so sorry, folks. I think you're going to have to look this up at home. Um, play slideshow. Okay. So, yes, my apologies. Um, 
I was planning to play that, but uh, I guess you're going to have to look it up online. And whilst you're looking at, just remember Smule, uh, there is a whole plethora of projects and sort of thing, apps that they've done, and they're just one better than the other. And this particular one is lots of fun because what basically what they've taken is they've taken the video. So you have an iPad application that you open up, and you, this, as you know, everything makes sound. Like there's a, I do that. That makes a sound, and anything anything I do, I click here. That makes a sound. I drink a sip of water. That makes sound like clothes rattle. So you you open up this application, and you basically take a little video with sound, and then you take another video with sound, and you take another video with sound, and you have a whole bunch of videos with sound, and then there's sort of a lined up you can probably see on this shot, like a kind of a drum machine, and you can just trigger them and play. And so you can create all sorts of musical patterns, and you can record the vocals as well. And, uh, and then if you have a couple of friends, they can record something, you can record something, you can just play together. So you, there's absolutely no musicianship needed over here. There's absolutely no sightseeing, reading notes, learning how to play guitar, anything like that. I mean, they're showing the keyboards there, but you can just record the piano and just make a note like that because it's video with sound. And you make it in time because you then play it like a drum machine. And I think that's genius. That's, that's absolutely genius, and it's sort of a, the, the, the entry point for making, collaborative music making with these kind of instruments are just so low, and they're so accessible to everybody. Of course, you have to have an iPad or iPhone or Android or something that this would play on, but apart from that, really, the, and the, the, um, these kind of applications are not even that expensive. So it's really no excuse for everybody uh, to get in some uh, small applications later on. So yes, as I was saying, design challenges, these are like challenges for designers. It's kind of when you're doing things like collaborative music making or mobile phone platforms or projects that I've showed early on, it's kind of, you have to kind of think that everybody needs, everything needs to go with everything because you just don't know how things are gonna be used. So you're trying to predict any possible scenarios, keys, tempos, etc. You've got hardware restrictions because, of course, if your phone doesn't have an accelerometer or you can't exactly you can't program for it, uh, then you won't be able to do things. Uh, and then, of course, you're trying to map things to users' mental model. So, so it's sort of really a no-brainer for them to what they need to do. Like on a mat pad, okay, I see now I have a grid, I press that, it plays. Well, I've just learned it in five seconds, it's a piece of cake. And, of course, you know, we want it to be fun, we want it to be social, so you can play with your friends. And depend, you know, if anybody has any kind of a, a mobile equipment, they can download the applications, whatever it is, old phone, new phone, and then we can all just play together. And it just like takes no time at all to put up a little uh, friendly band together. Now, uh, I just wanted to talk about sort of uh, some other ways how um, these kind of projects, these kind of collaborative music making projects, are made by artists to engage the public. So when I mean engaging the public, it's sort of when you make like an installation uh, that's uh, publicly available, so it's free, so you don't have to download it. You just have to show up and then you do some stuff with some people that are there. They could be your friends, they could be not your friends, like people that are passing on the street. And one of the projects that I'm a big fan of is this project called the, the Made by Mobile Performance Group. They sort of use this shopping trolley that they're augmented and they put loads of sensor on it. So they just put it in the street, hooked up with some of the wires, and basically you can touch it and then you make sound. So that's kind of even more no-brainer. You don't even have to have a mobile phone. There's something there, it's free. Get a group of passers-by and you make some sort of a music together. And I think uh, uh, that's kind of, a, you know, those kind of things you find in like, um, um, exhibition spaces, like uh, galleries, or sorts of other kind of you know art festivals when people are just kind of bring some technology and then just pass by. You can play a little bit with it, and then you just kind of go on. I think I'm going to try to play a video of the Cave of Sounds, which is one of the examples of uh, some friends of mine that I did, and they're part of the uh, music hack space. Um, it was part of the residency at music hack space, so the whole bunch of people have made these instruments and they were based on the cave uh, musical kind of a making and back in the caveman days. But I think this video is going to play, so I'm going to step down and let the cave of sounds is an interactive Tim explain how it works. New musical instruments in a circle. And it's a participatory work for audience members to come along and experiment with these different sounds. The installation is the result of a 10-month process where we've been meeting up regularly to create new musical instruments. We began by exploring the ideas of prehistoric music. What was the drive for people to come together to start creating sound together? 
we've got eight instruments. Three of them are based on the connects and they respond to the physical movement of the body. Two of them are based on light. One of them is a drone that responds through shining a light over different parts. Another one is a shadow instrument. One of them is based on the theremin. And one is a sphere with an accelerometer and a gyroscope inside. And we also have one which is a glove and a hat. And it's a percussive piece that you play by tapping your fingers against the hat. So we're really trying to encourage people to look up into this circle and be a part of this unified collection. And we're sending OSC messages to some central system, which allows the instruments to identify places to converge and identify when people are communicating with each other. But it will also inform this visual projection coming down in the center. After people have been there for a while, they gradually begin to converge on common ideas. They notice each other and interactions begin to happen. It's an opportunity to experiment with entirely brand new instruments that nobody knows how to play. But it's also a chance to come and connect with strangers and also with your friends on these instruments and find ways of using music as a way to communicate with each other. So as you can see, you can sort of call this cave of sounds because it's kind of a bit like an orchestra as well of different type of devices. Some are using Kinect, so you're not actually even touching anything. It's just mapping up your movement to space and changing sounds. Some are kind of a devices that are hacked into and you can put them in your hand and you can put them on your head. Or theremine is like you can sort of play with it a little bit. But again, is this was this again is a free well free project because it was installed at the um, first at the Music Tech Festival, then at the Hack the Barbican, and it's kind of the project that you can then bring with you and as I said, passers-by or visitors just come in there and then engage with one another. So in the first instance, what happens is they're like, okay, there's an instrument, I'm making some sound, I don't know what I'm making, and okay, that person is doing something else, waving their hands, what's going on? And after they get to know what their instrument is doing, then you see them spontaneously trying to kind of negotiate, oh, I'm playing now, and that person's playing now, or I'm going to add something to it. And this is how they're sort of without even like, sometimes they even talk to each other, say, oh, well, you do this and I'll do that. You get this kind of a spontaneous collaboration and negotiation about in, a, in this kind of a musical space about what they're going to do together to create this uh, composition better. And sometimes they practice and then, you know, go back to it. And, uh, and it's real good fun. And as well, as I said, sort of thing, it's free and anybody can do it. And it's quite experimental. And so kids can do it, old people can do it, anybody can do it. One of the other projects that I also wanted to, I think I'll be able to play this as well, is also based on this sort of a collaborative music making for, for everybody in a public space. And this is a project by my colleague Ben Bengler from Queen Mary's University. And it is actually his research project. So we took this project to VNA and then he took it to China, uh, and then we took it to Sonar Music Festival. And so it was interesting, we sort of, uh, uh, he's re-engineered the launch pad into an interface, then reprogrammed it so it doesn't need a computer or anything like that. All the sounds that are there are the ones that are programmed for you. But it's the, the, the interfaces are really easy to play. So we didn't kind of give out any instructions. We didn't facilitate much. We were just like standing back and watching what people are doing. And I'm going to show you a video so you can see. Is it playing? Oh. So this is a launch pad. If anybody recognizes it, a little bit modified because it's got a little wheel that we added onto it and there's some things going on underneath the hood. And it kind of works like a um, sequencer. So the three launch pads are in uh, sync with one another. So you can't be out of uh, time, you can't be out of key, and they've got a uh, uh, slight variation in the sound. And you can't see actually from this particular video is that on the table in front of every lounge pad, there's a speaker which is underneath, there's just a cloth which is uh, facing each player. So each player can hear their uh, uh, contribution as well as other two players around the table. So see, people are just kind of pressing the buttons. Those are the questionnaires on the table. Because <laughs> this, is, this is a research study, still is actually his PhD. 
So yeah, so we've actually found out that, uh, found, I mean, when we were at the Sonar Festival, at the VNA, it was kind of a quite a different crowd because you had loads of kids. That was during the digital uh, weekend at the VNA. And we had kids which are like, I don't know, three years old playing. Uh, when he presented it in China at the exhibition, there was a baby on the table sitting and just kind of pressing the button with his mother. Um, and we also had, the VNA was funny, we had a 13-year-old girl who was like, after she sussed out how it works, we were just observing things, videoing, taking questionnaires. She started explaining to everybody, you know, how it's, it's like, no, this is how you do it. And then you do that and then da da da. So we're thinking, okay, she sussed it out. Now she's teaching everybody. And so no, that's really interesting kind of thing that happened. If you just leave people in a space with these instruments that you've designed and just observe what happens, you will see that if somebody sussed out something, then they'll be very eager to teach the other person how it does. And then this kind of knowledge gets passed on. And, and the fact that kind of anybody can, anybody can play it and you can't be out of time, you can't be out of key, is sort of a, just sort of an added bonus. Where we uh, presented this project at the Sona Music Festival, of course, there was all the music festival goers, techno, we had a different kind of a sound set. So one of the um, interfaces was a drum machine. So it played a little bit different. It was like kind of a techno sound set that we had in the afternoons. And you had all these uh, uh, real musos coming, you know, in, in pairs of threes or friends or whatever. And they were like, OK, you play this and you play that. Yeah, yeah. And there was kind of, yeah, yeah, sort of hands in the air. And it was, uh, we were just observing, thinking, oh, OK, this is fun. <laughs> and when we were talking to them, they were like, this is, oh, can I take this home? This, this interface is just like, I want to have this. So it's, I think it's sort of a, this, you know, we might be moving into this kind of a new era when we are uh, when we're designing these instruments which are have no learning curve really it's like a very low entry you just basically need to get it out there and people just put their hands on there and they don't have to worry about whether they're musicians whether they don't know anything they just kind of see something is happening and it comes back and it comes and if I press something here it goes red and I hear a note it's just a really kind of a, a really simple kind of a learning. And you can observe actually these kind of things with, with adults. It's sort of a, they're sometimes when they come to a gallery, they're, they're not sure whether they're supposed to be touching something and they don't know who the people are on the table. So they watch and they're kind of a bit scared. But children just go in there and they start pressing and it's like, mom, look, da, da, da. and they sort of, they have kind of a no, no fear whatsoever. And in some of the young kids, actually, you can, you can see when they start doing the, um, the kind of a sliding thing up the scale, because there's eight notes. Da, 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 da. And when they're actually sass out, that that's what they've just done. It's, it, you can just see when something just goes click, and they've just understood it. So, you know, you're watching somebody five years old thinking, I think he's getting it now. You, you can just kind of see what's happening in their, uh, in their head, which is an awful lot of fun. I just, um, let's see what else we've got here. Ah, cool. Uh, I think, yes, I just, uh, this is one of the projects that I've done recently with my girls hacking club, which is called the Light Touch. So because we are a hacking club and we like to hack into things, we uh, hacked into lasers and we decided to kind of make uh, instruments in space, so map and app architecture with the lasers that play the sound. So this interaction was even more simpler than the other one because all people had to do is sort of a break the laser beam and that will make the sound. And then, of course, you have different kind of instruments with different notes, and then people can just kind of play something over here and play something over there. And the same kind of negotiation uh, has been had uh, even between people that don't know each other. It was like, oh, you played that note a little bit more, oh, you played the bass, let me play this. And they were kind of doing that in space. Unfortunately, I don't have a very long video of that. I'll try to play it so you can see. So the lasers are just played in space, and we have, we used haze. Uh, to make them visible. So it's a little bit hazy in, the, in there. And this was exhibited at the uh, Digital Shortage Festival uh, this year. And now we're taking it to Marseille to this conference, CMMR conference. And I think uh, later on in the year, we're going to exhibit it in a church, I believe. So that should be interesting. And uh, interesting thing about this, for instance, is as opposed to kind of interfaces from polymetros, is interfaces, you know, you need a table and there's a uh, kind of everything is organized as a speaker, speaker there, speaker there, table, people come to the table, do this sort of things. With this kind of scenario, because they're lasers and they can be shooting up that way and that way, and you can even shoot them on the corner if you have little... Um, mirrors, you are really, uh, you can map out the architectural space. Every time you move into new space, you can make a new configuration. And of course, you can reprogram the instruments to play different sounds. So you can constantly be involving this idea and uh, constantly sort of uh, evaluating and surprising the uh, general public to see what they're going to do. 
Uh, some of the tools uh, that are used in projects like Light Touch, like Polymetrics, etc., are programs like MaxMSP in Jitter, uh, Super Collider, Ixilang. That's one of the programs that sort of it sits on top of the Super Collider, which is used for live coding. Chuck as well is one that was used for the, uh, which is, um, uh, I believe, the PhD thesis from Gewang. And so he kind of used it in the, uh, uh, plor uh, sorry, in the um, Stanford Laptop Orchestra. And then, of course, Ableton, you can hook that up to MaxMSP, et cetera, and that's kind of a quite an easy learning curve. And in the first instance, I think we used Max for Live for the project with the laser. And we hacked into it, I think it was about 10 days or a week, put it all together. And so it was, um, it was good fun. And uh, I just forgot to mention, actually, MaxMSP, you can also use pure data, which is a similar sort of a object-oriented uh, uh, programming environment. Uh, Super Collider is, of course, free, Xilang as well, Chuck, Ableton, costs some money, but not hugely expensive, especially if you're a student. And tools and hardware, I mean, this is just when I was uh, doing some circuit bending at the Barcelona Music Hack Day uh, last year. Um, I've sort of hacked into a musical toy, which was, you can see, I mean, that looks like a huge musical toy, but actually it was that small. And I seriously really needed a much smaller soldering iron than that, because when I opened it up, everything was so tiny. But some of the things, if you want to modify the toys to make them into instruments, or even like hack into lasers, etc., you know, the usual things are the soldering irons, all sorts of kind of wiring and sensors. You can use Arduinos and etc. And yes, I just want to sort of leave it to with the uh, one final word saying that, you know, learning new stuff is fun. So you should do it, do it. You should get this book if you're interested in the circuit bending. This is Reed Gazala, it's the Bible about the circuit bending. And it's really so simple to use. When I was at Barcelona, I was just like, okay, I just got this book from eBay, page one. Let's open up this interface. Let's see what's going on. Okay, now they tell me I need to do that and I make a hole there. Okay, next page and I do that and oh, I get the sound out. So it's really easy to follow. And I think that's, that's why he sort of make it that way. And that's just a picture of Jihak doing um, a workshop. So we sort of uh, did some installations and then we did a workshop to teach some other girls how to do their own using like Reactive Vision uh, software processing and MaxMSP. And there is a lots of technical workshops in which you can learn some of the skills to get you going. So there's no really no reason not to sort of find your own uh, laptop orchestra tomorrow. Just call up a couple of friends, go on to a few workshops, learn a couple of bits of software, get some Ethernet cables, hook them all up together, buy some IKEA bowls like they did at Stanford, put some speakers in there and make some multi-channel uh, speaker system and voila, here you go. So I believe we are on time. Thank you very much. This is a, if you want to drop me a line or uh, look up some of the stuff uh, from GHAC website, some of the project that we've done, feel free to do so. And uh, with this, I will just uh, see if audience has uh, any questions. I was just expecting this gentleman here to be in the audience. Now you're kind of throwing me a little bit. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions about any of the projects or software or laptop orchestra or, or, or is everybody just kind of taking it all in now? I was going to say I could play some ZX Spectrum, but remembered we don't have internet in the cabling here. No questions? Ooh, okay. I gave it all away. <laughs> Thank you.